And just like that, you are four countries away and almost 4,000 miles north of where Tristan is, to, Tristan was just speaking to you from. My name is Stefan Dubur. We have Senzo today on camera and we welcome you to this safari, this live safari all the way from Kenya. This is what's happening right now at um, just 10 to 5 here in the afternoon. And there you have a herd of elephant, a breeding herd of elephant, as is evidenced by that youngster that just fell into the hole there <laughs> with mom turning around just to give him a hand. <laughs> Shame. You can see how attentive mother elephant are. It really just goes to show you that they don't let even a little slip up like that go unnoticed. So herds in the Maasai Mara are slightly bigger than in Kenya. Oh, look, in the foreground, you've got some warthog as well. Almost the same size as that little elephant that fell into the hole with mom. Glenn, you wanted to know what the most exciting thing about being a guide is. Glenn, for me, the most exciting thing about being a guide is, is probably the ability to dip yourself into a life-threatening situation come out on the other side and figure out what type of person you are um, it's one of those careers very similar to i suppose a fighter pilot or a fireman or a policeman so you put into situations that are, are, are fantastic situations it just so happens that these situations are with large animals and dangerous lions and leopard that could jump into the car at any moment and doing nighttime safaris like we do out here and it just I suppose you come out of a situation like that just knowing yourself a little bit better I suppose I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie even though I'm considered to have to be mature at this particular moment in time I still like wearing shorts and playing in the mud and sand and grass out here and have been doing so for the last 20 years or so so it is absolutely a viable career and absolutely what I enjoy doing now Let's go back to that zebra because it answers Pat's question who wanted to know which species dominate the waterholes. Pat, at this time of the day, what dominates the waterholes is exactly what you're looking at right now. Those elephants, they love to drink in the middle of the day and, the, and, the, and toward the end of the afternoon. Equally, in the middle of the day, warthog come and bathe in the mud. And the reason why they do that is because lion activity is almost at a zero during the middle of the day it's not 100 percent zero but almost at a zero and for warthogs to spend some time coming to a dangerous if you go left you'll see them with the zebra what for, there we go for warthogs it is a little bit dangerous to approach water lions quite often line ambush around water holes and are the favorite food of lion and so they come and bath in the mud in the middle of the day. You can actually see that the belly of that pig on the right hand side has some mud on it. You can see evidenced by the slightly different color that you can see there. They're fairly big. You get them roughly about 200 pounds when they're at their largest. Let's go a little bit to the left and I will show you exactly what is a lion's favorite food. There we go. Now Doug, you've just asked, could teachers do anything to prepare their students for the safari school drive? Doug, yes, absolutely you could. Um, you know, to have a basic understanding of what to expect is always a good thing. You know, um, it's a much deeper experience, a much richer experience to discuss topics rather than discuss what that is. So for instance, it's good to know that a striped horse-like animal that is black and white is a zebra. And they live on these African plains and in the Maasai Mara at least anyway, you have zebra that live here but you also have zebra that migrate and that will lead on to a discussion for instance around the great migration which we're here to see and witness. Um, it also might open up topics depending on the age of the kids in question as to why uh, zebras are stripy, why they always like living in the open sun, um, what herd structures are like. And so those are really rich, rewarding discussions. Um, you know, obviously if the children are at a much lower age, then why this is a horse is more pertinent than, you know, what the social hierarchy in a zebra herd is. But nevertheless, it is just wonderful to see for me, some of the favorite patterns on 
a zebra is that over the front leg, across the shoulder, you can see where the patterns come together there. And if you asked someone to draw stripes on a body shape like that, I don't think that they'd get it as perfect first, first time round. On the topic of zebras spending some time in the sun, there, there is actually a theory that uh, zebras are black and white with those stripes to help cool them down, a type of thermoregulation, uh, and that the black stripes get hotter and so radiate heat off, thus sucking heat out of the white stripes and pulsating heat off. So you've got these alternating bands of heat and cooling and that allows them to stay out in the sun for a little bit longer. Now Tracy, you just wanted to know, um, Oh, forgive me, I've actually forgotten your question right now, Tracy. If I could ask uh, Kirsty just to repeat. Ah, Katie, you wanted to know if this, uh, if this uh, area, or how long this area has been protected from hunting. Katie, this reserve is one of the oldest reserves uh, in Africa. Um, there's a camp here called Governor's Camp, which has been here since the 1970s, and since those times, uh, this area has been relatively free of hunting. Kenya has been free of hunting for ooh, decades now, so there hasn't been uh, safari operators in Kenya that were allowed to shoot animals for profit uh, for decades now. A really progressive African country when it comes down to hunting. Hunting, of course, is not bad. Hunting in its in its pure sense and rightly managed is one of the primary. Um, uh, primary, let me say, uh, f conservation forces. It quite quickly gets eclipsed by the more sophisticated ways of tourism management and conservation. And so once hunting has gone in and stabilized an area, uh, employed people that were subsistence farming or subsistence hunting or poaching on that particular area, employed them, uh, quite often they get eclipsed by the more sophisticated and higher revenue uh, tourism, uh, I suppose, institutions, very similar to uh, Angola Mara, for instance, or Little Governors, or Governors Camp, for that matter of fact. Um, so hunting hasn't been allowed here for a long time. It doesn't mean that hunting doesn't happen, though. At a subsistence level, hunting will happen all over Africa. There's a lot of hun hungry mouths to feed in Africa. And so you do get subsistence hunting or subsistence poaching here uh, as well. Commercial poaching is controlled quite heavily by very active anti-poaching units uh, that, are, that are active in the Mara Triangle and the Masai Mara. And so although it does occur, it, it, it hasn't really been able to escalate in scale as it did in the 1980s when rhino poaching and elephant poaching was pretty much, in my opinion, as it, at its height in these areas. And as you can see from the health of these elephant herds that we have, it's working incredibly well. Now, Sarah, you wanted to know what adaptations elephants have to enable them to survive in this area. Sarah, um, they're clever. They've got a very large brain, and that allows them to be incredibly adaptable. They're large, so they don't get preyed upon. Uh, they've got a trunk, which allows them to pick up food uh, at any level, so higher than them, uh, but also deeper than what they can push their bodies into vegetation. So that allows them to feed on a much wider piece of any bush. They're strong, so they can push trees over and get to their roots, which would otherwise be hidden under the ground. They've got tusks, which allow them to pry bark off of trees, which allows them to get to the very nutritious and uh, mineral-laden layers of cambium underneath the bark. Um, what else? They are very hardy. They can go walk incredible distances between feeding areas and water. They have a very thick skin which acts as a sun retardant, although they do get quite hot on their skin, but it allows their body to cool down. They've also got those enormous ears which act as radiator fans, cooling the central body temperature down and that allows their blood to stay cool and allows them out when other animals are seeking shade. They're good mothers. They've got long uh, uh, what are this? gestation periods. You're looking at 22 months for an elephant. So babies are born pretty much fully formed and so mothers can spend a long time on a single calf teaching them what they need to, to learn. They're long lived which means they can build up a vast experience. Um, of knowledge, where to go when it's dry, where to go when it's wet, what to do 
when the wind blows, when there's fire, when there's not so much food, which trees are ripe when. And Sarah, I'm running out of things to say actually. I think I might be, hopefully I'm not boring you with an endless barrage of stuff, but do you know I'm running out at the end of my adaptations list for elephant. <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. But uh, Tristan has managed to find himself one of my favorite uh, bodies of water at Juma. And uh, so we are going to be throwing you to the south of the African continent and I'll catch up with you a bit later.